Good evening, everybody. It is about 5.45 p.m. on Thursday, July 17th, and I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that I received the FIO M11 digital audio player today, and uh, brand new condition. I got it at a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a discount. It wasn't a significant discount, but it was a discount. Uh, so we will begin the review process on that as soon as I have a chance to do the unboxing and try to get to learn the ins and outs of the player. Especially I'm interested in the uh, all to DSD feature that the M11 has, which is really the, the biggest feature the M11 has when compared to other similarly situated, similarly priced players. I don't think that the M11 has anything else that's really outstanding. So the all to DSD you know, if it makes a huge difference in the sound quality, then that might be something worth considering. But we'll come to figure that out eventually. The bad news is that I found out today that the United States Postal Service misdelivered the Cord Mojo, and we can't find it. I can't find it. They delivered it to a different address. I had to go to the USPS post office today, the station itself, because they would not pick up the phone. I kept calling and calling this morning, and they wouldn't pick up. So I physically showed up, and I said, where's my package? It says that it was delivered to a person, to an individual, it said on the on the tracking website. Who was it delivered to? Now, the guy at, at the station seemed to, to disbelieve me because, you know, obviously it was delivered. USPS never makes mistakes. So he goes to his computer, pulls up the information, and he says, well, it looks like it was delivered. Was it delivered to a family member? I said, no, it wasn't delivered to a family member. Who I don't have a family member around here. Who was it delivered to? He goes, well, let me check the GPS information because sometimes we can check the GPS location. He checks the GPS location, and lo and behold, it was delivered to the wrong address. All of a sudden, he looked ashamed, which he should have for not believing me. And he said, you know, I have to get my supervisor. So he goes and gets his supervisor, and the supervisor says, hmm, well, you know, uh, we'll take down your information. Just write it down on this piece of paper, and uh, we'll get back to you. Fantastic. That's just great. The chances of USPS getting back to me about this purchase are zero. Literally zero. So I contacted eBay, and I said, look, here's the situation. I laid it out for them. They said, okay, we'll open up a claim against you. We'll have the seller respond. Now, mind you, I had contacted the seller yesterday, and I said, look, I didn't get the package. I'm going to open a case through USPS. I'd like you to do the same because you might have better luck since you're the shipper. doesn't get back to me, this guy. So US eBay opens his claim. An hour later, the seller responds saying, it shows that it was delivered, and that's all I have to, to show. Well, eBay, and I kid you not, 15 minutes after the seller submits that response, which was it shows that the tracking information says that it was delivered, the eBay says, we're going to close the case, and you're not getting a refund. So I'm out of the money, and I also don't have the, the item, and nobody is willing to help. I was livid, and I think anybody in my situation would be very, very upset with this. This seller has an obligation as a legal obligation when you make a contract on eBay to make sure that the delivery was done. After I provided him with all the information, including the case number with USPS that I had opened yesterday, I said, please do something. And he didn't do it. He did nothing. And eBay is of no help whatsoever. So my only hope now, my only hope is that USPS gets back to me. And I just said a few moments ago, that is unlikely to happen. Probably 0% chance. There you go. There is my odyssey into the realm of eBay and how eBay is a load of crap. Okay? I'm glad I got that off my chest because I've was i I've been very, very upset about this for the last hour and a half or so, and there's nothing I can do. It, it, at some point, maybe USPS might give up and say, okay, well, we might give you some money for this. But no matter how well a transaction may go on eBay, it, uh, it, you can never be sure. This seller seemed very good. I mean, he had good reviews. He didn't, hadn't been around selling for a very long time, but he had good communication. You know, price was fine. He shipped it on time. The tracking information was there. It's not his fault that USPS screwed up, 
but it is, it is his fault that he refused to respond to me after I sent him an email and that he refuses to communicate with me about what the issue is. So what can you do? I mean, it's not like I have a bad buying history. I have a stellar buying history since 2006. I have 100% over 280 reviews. And so, you know, it's an unfortunate situation all around. Uh, so depressing. Okay, so I'm going to try to power through this. I didn't even want to do this video today, but I, I just, I got to do something so my mind is off of the situation. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about MQA and DSD. I'm sorry, there's no enthusiasm in my voice. There should be, and there isn't. Let's talk about MQA and DSD. An explanation for those overwhelmed by marketing mumbo jumbo. Give me a second. Let me let me channel my inner self so that I can be more upbeat about this. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about MQA and DSD. An explanation for those overwhelmed by marketing mumbo jumbo. That was better. Marketing mumbo jumbo. Why are we talking about MQA and DSD? Well, because a lot of times when you when you look at higher priced and by higher price I mean two hundred and fifty dollars and more uh, higher priced products, whether it's a DAC or it's a digital audio player or it's a streaming device, they mention PCM and MQA and DSD and title says MQA and you really want to figure out what is this stuff? What are these acronyms? And it's really hard to figure it out. Because the manufacturers that are selling those products, the players, the streamers, the DACs, the amplifiers, they don't provide you an explanation. And so you got to go hunting for it. And all f when I did this research, I have to tell you, I was confused out of my mind. Because there's a lot of mathematic mathematics involved here and number crunching for your processor. And for a normal person who was not raised to know mathematics, because I was taught in America... Uh, I, it seemed totally foreign to me because, once again, I was taught in America. Numbers don't really work well with us Americans. Uh, we like big things, but that's about it. So I had to distill this so that a, a dum-dum like me could figure this stuff out. And I'm hoping that it's, it's understandable for everybody. It, there's going to be, in, inevitably, there will be somebody out there who will know more than me and who's going to say, mm, that's not quite right, or you are totally wrong about this. I Look, I understand. If you know better, please do correct. Do it in a civil way, but please do correct me in the comments. If you think, oh, look, I think you have a misunderstanding about this, perfect. Please put it in the comments, and I'm sure that people will get to it. I'll even pin it to the top of the comments if I can. Okay, let's just get it started, huh? This is going to cause some arguments. It really will. It really will. But trust me, people are going to start arguing about MQA and DSD and PCM because if you go on HetFi or other uh, websites, forums, discussing this sort of stuff, people argue. So this might cause some arguments. Let's start with PCM first. Okay, PCM first, please. What does it stand for? Because it really doesn't matter, but it ma what it stands for is pulse code modulation. It means nothing. It just all this code modulation. They needed an acronym, and that's, you know, this, how about PCM? What does it stand for? Uh, pulse? I have a pulse. Code? We can code things. And mod modulation? Everybody likes modulate. Pulse code modulation. That's all it means. It's used in converting analog signals to digital for DVD, CDs, and Blu-ray booths. So, so here's what happens. I'll give you an example. You have an orchestra, and the orchestra is playing. Obviously, it's playing analog, right? It's playing instruments, actual physical instruments. And there is a device, microphones, and those microphones are picking up the waves, the sound waves, and they're being transmitted electromagnetically through the circuit to a recording device. How that recording device actually crunches the numbers, the digital information that's coming in through the analog, which is the sound waves, is the actual... Uh, technology here and so what PCM does is that it takes that raw information from the microphone that's picking it all up and it then codes it now this is all back end right this is not necessarily happening all in real time but it's once it's get recorded at some point PCM the technology itself the court the code crunching the analytics involved 
crunch the numbers and then it compresses it into DVD, CD, and Blu-ray use. Okay, but it becomes uncompressed signal once you send it out of the CD, DVD, Blu-ray. It's it, meaning whatever it's recorded on that CD gets out of that CD, so there's no more further compression after it's been recorded. It works best with HDMI, especially if you have Dolby Digital Technology that's part of your sound system. Why does it work best with HDMI? Because the sys the signal itself is uncompressed. It's raw as it's recorded on the device, on the DVD, CD, or Blu-ray. Now imagine this. If you have a Blu-ray that has, how much, how many gigabytes is a Blu-ray now? I, I don't know. Six, gig six gigabytes? Is, is that right? Four or six gigabytes? Maybe more? Whatever the gigabyte ranges for Blu-ray. A lot of that is taken up by the video, clearly. But a lot of that is also taken up by the sound because the sound has to be as pristine as the video. So they try to keep it as uncompressed as possible. So that's a lot of digital information that's coming. Regular RCA cables or optical will not have the bandwidth, whereas HDMI does. It's usually available, PCM, usually available at 16 bits or 24 bits with a sampling rate of up to 192 kilohertz. And all CDs are recorded in PCM. Okay, every CD is recorded in PCM. I don't know of any CD. I, I, look, I did a bit brief research on this, but something should have shown up. I don't know of any CD that said we recorded this in DSD or MQA quality. It was PCM. And as you find, as you'll find out at the very end of this, that there is somebody else who says the same thing. And I'll just tell you now, it's Steve Gutenberg, the audiophiliac. If you haven't gone to his uh, YouTube channel, go check it out. He's fantastic. He's very calm, very relaxing. He knows his stuff, <clears throat> whether you agree with him or you disagree with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Steve Gutenberg is a great resource. And he has a brief video about PCM and MQA and all that stuff. I have a link on the Google document here <clears throat> for that video. So if you get a chance, watch that video. Let's talk bits. Right? We talked about, I just mentioned 16 bits or 24 bits, 192 kilohertz. What does that all mean? Right? We, we throw these numbers around, manufacturers say all these numbers, but what does it actually mean? Well, get ready for some number crunching. Okay? Bits describe the amount of detail or resolution that is encoded in an audio file. It's a mathematical conversion. It's an exponent. Right? It's exponential. So I'll give you an example and then I'll break this down as best as I can. Let's assume you have 4-bit audio. If you have 4-bit audio, that results in 16 levels of resolution. Why? It's 2 to the power of 4. Okay, so that's 16. 4 times 4 would be 16, right? So that's, or you could say 4 squared. Yeah, that's what it would, it would be, 4 squared. Uh, 4 times 4 is 16. If you have 16 bits, it's 2 to the power of 16 or 16 to the, yeah 2 to the power of 16 so that gives you 65,536 levels of resolution when you have 24-bit audio that results in 16 million bear with me here 16 million 777,216 levels of resolution you might be saying where are you pulling these numbers out well first of all I researched it so you know you can find all this stuff on Wikipedia very easily, but I also cross-checked it with articles, so it's not just Wikipedia. And on top of that, I'll show you in the next couple of slides how the numbers work out. Okay, so all of this, it's exponential. It's not just 4 times 4. 4 times 4 will give you 16, right? But if you have 16, it's 16 times 16 times 6, right? It just keeps, it's an exponential. It, whatever you generate, it multiplied again by that same number. The higher the resolution, the more detail that can be captured in the gradation. So when you're talking about levels, think of a ladder, okay? And as the ladder on a pyramid, okay, think of a pyramid, an Egyptian pyramid, and you have all those steps all the way to the top. The, let's say it's a 100-foot pyramid, and uh, each step is 3 feet tall. That means you gotta you gotta jump up every three foot because there's only sixteen levels or whatever, right? Let's just imagine there's only sixteen levels all the way to the top. That's a lot for you to jump up every step in order to get to the top. It's harder for you to get there. 
But if you have more steps, let's say you have 65,000 steps all the way to the top of the 100-foot uh, pyramid, it's easier for you to get up there. If you have 16 million steps all the way up to the top of this 100-foot pyramid, it's even easier for you to get up there. Okay. Now, at some point, the difference between 16 million and 30 million won't make any difference. But does that kind of does that kind of explain why we're talking about steps and levels? The more steps you have, the more gradations you will get. The more and those gradations is what carries and has contains the depth, the airiness, the width, all that real meaty information in a sound file. It's in all of that levels of resolution. So the smaller the resolution, the less information that is being carried. The bigger the resolution, the more information that can be carried. Not, not that it will be, but just that it can be. So here's how to calculate bits. It is exponential. The mathematical formula is 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of bits. And 2 is the integer value of 0 or 1, which is how computers work. It's either on or off, 0 or 1. So for a 16-bit, it's 2 to the power of 16, which results in the number we got, 65,536. For 24 bits, it's 2 to the power of 24, which is 16,777,216. This is how the math actually works out. If you have a scientific calculator, put the numbers in. Literally, this is the math. Okay, so that's where we get the bits. That's where we get the steps. Now let's talk about sample rates. Now remember, I spoke about sample rates originally about PCM, where PCM is 16 or 24 bit, right? 65,000 or 16 million steps of, of data, of resolution, with a sampling rate of 192 kilohertz. So now that we know what bits are, what is 192 kilohertz? What do kilohertz have anything to do with the bits. Well, the, the kilohertz is the sampling rate. It's measurement per second. I'll give it to you in the simplest way that we can. CD quality is 44.1 kilohertz. That means the analog signal is sampled 44,100 times per second. So the, the signal is processed and sampled and checked 44,000 times per second as it's being streamed. So the more resolution you have, the higher the sample rate should be so that you're actually sampling everything and you, you're getting all of that resolution. If you have lower sampling rate but a higher resolution, then you're not really taking full benefit, which is why it goes hand in hand when manufacturers say we have you know 16 bit at uh, you know 92 kilohertz or 16 bit at 192 kilohertz. The, that has to be go hand in hand. But a recording that's, say, 16-bit, but you have a, a sample rate of, what's a high sample rate, 256 kilohertz? That doesn't mean that your sampling, that your sampling rate is going to automatically make the sound sound better because the resolution is simply not there. Does that kind of make sense? The higher the resolution, the higher the sample rate should be. But the lower the resolution, the higher the sample rate will not cure any deformities in the sound recording because the lower resolution. Does that kind of make sense? Sampling rates are typically between 44.1 kilohertz and 48 kilohertz, but that's, you know, that's just generally speaking. It can be higher, and in fact, if you have some computers, if you have a Macintosh, you can actually go into your sound settings and you can select through the MIDI application, M-I-D-I, the MIDI application, the, the response rate or the sample rate. And you can go from 44.1 all the way up to like 256 or even higher, 512, I think, and you can hear a slight stop in the music that you're playing when you change from one sample rate to another. And then you almost think that I usually do. I almost think that there's, oh, there's a big difference. There is no difference because the music that I'm playing, it's just not, it, it, there's no higher resolution to it. But it, it, just because it's 44.1 doesn't mean that your system can't handle more. Computers can, in fact, interpolate more, can sample faster and higher. 48 kilohertz is often used in music, uh, excuse me, movie production. And that information is from this link. If you want to go and double check me, go ahead. But why, do, why is this important? Because, look, if you're sitting down in a movie, in a movie, at a movie, in a movie theater, you're surrounded by now, generally, THX 
uh, speakers, quality speakers. And a lot of blockbuster movies are now demanding, especially movies like Star Wars, are now demanding that theaters uh, meet the certain criteria for the sound and the, and the movie and the picture itself. So the quality has to be to a certain bare minimum. And if a studio, a movie studio, is recording audio at 48 kilohertz to be used and projected and to be shown to people across the world at a high sample rate in 4K movie, right? Or Blu-ray depth vision or whatever, you know, 3D vision, whatever the hell they're, they're doing now. If it's good enough for Hollywood at 48 kilohertz, it's probably good enough for everybody else. But these people make money off of trying to convince you that something is amazing. And if 48 kilohertz sounds great to you in a movie theater, maybe 48 kilohertz, it's great, period. And getting a higher sample rate may not make a huge difference. But that's just something, you know, it's a food for thought. And as I said just a few moments ago, higher sample rates doesn't necessarily mean noticeably better sound. Let's talk about the marketing hype machine. You know, you often read articles, if you research about this stuff, you often read articles in sales descriptions that a DAC or a, a DAP has MQA or DSD capability. But, you know, the price hike is justified by that statement. This has MQA. This has DSD. And audiophiles speak of DSD and MQA to argue positions or more exactly argue against somebody else's position. So what is DSD and MQA? Now that we understand what PCM is and we understand bit rates and sample rates, I mean, dumbed down version for me and hopefully understandable to everybody else. Now let's talk about MQA and DSD because this all builds upon PCM, all builds upon sampling rates and resolution. What is MQA? It's Master Quality Authenticated. Oh my goodness, it sounds so wonderful. It sounds, you know, it sounds so British. It's Master Quality Authenticated. That's not a British accent. Oh my God, my British accent is so bad. It's Master Quality Authenticated. A standard for high resolution recordings. It's one file package type that all recording studios can implement if they want to. And it's one standard that can be implemented by various sources like Tidal or Otervana. Now, this is for streaming. So MQA is for streaming. It's, it's, it's made for use on streaming services. MQA files are encoded in a particular way to keep the files high resolution, but relatively small size as it's being streamed. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, the dogs are barking again. Simply put, MQA blurs high-frequency data that is inaudible by the human ear into frequencies that are, thereby not encoding all the frequencies. You're not getting all the raw data at the same time. And so the audible and inaudible are kind of blended together. E meaning, when you have raw data like PCM, everything is sampled, everything is encoded equally. The stuff that you can hear and the stuff that you can't hear. For MQA, the stuff that you can hear is given priority, whereas the stuff that you cannot hear is recorded or, or encoded, more specifically, is encoded uh, more compressed, essentially. It's folded into, it's smeared into the other audible frequencies. That's why it's, I say it folds into unimportant frequencies, quote-unquote, into 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bits, which can be folded into higher resolution with MQA decoder later. So what happens is it folds, it compresses the unwanted or unnecessary information, and then it sends it. What happens after it's sent? Well, how can MQA be played? Any player or app can play MQA encoded files, but only at CD quality. Well, what is CD quality? Now, remember, I said it's 44.1 kilohertz, right? And 44.1 kilohertz, and it's usually, you know, 16 bit, 44.1, uh, 16 bit, or it can be 24 bit, maybe. Uh, but that's PCM because all CDs are recorded at PCM. So any, any player, any amplifier, any DAC, any computer can play MQA files. You're just not getting the 
unpackaging the decoding of the encoded MQA file. You're only getting that file in CD quality, only. However, you need a player or app with the MQA decoder to take advantage of the file format's high resolution, right? So Tidal has that built in, and digital audio players now have that built in. So if you have a recording, a file that is recorded in MQA format, the player itself is able to decode that for all players, all file formats, um, all applications inside that, that digital audio player. MQA is designed for streaming services, so it's not the best quality that can ever be achieved, right? So when people say it's MQA, it doesn't mean that it's the highest standard possible. No, it just means that for streaming, it's pretty darn good compared to, you know, what we're used to with streaming. Um, so don't get misled by this. You know, I, I want to emphasize MQA is not, even though it says master quality authenticated, it's not the highest resolution. It's only high resolution for streaming. Can you still hear the difference between MQA files and really high res PCA, PCM files uh, or other file formats that are more uncompressed or less compressed? It's the appropriate linguistic way to say it. The answer is probably yes, depending on various other factors, but all things being equal, yes. But there are some concerns about MQA that some people have voiced on the internet. They say that if it is standardized, then possibly it can become a DRM type lockout, digital rights management type lockout. Now, what's DRM? Most of you, if not all of you, already know, but DRM is, it's been around forever. But basically, what DRM does, it, it locks you out from using a file, a disk, uh, a game, a CD, whatever until there is a decoder and the decoder is able to unlock unpack the file sometimes that decoder is a microchip sometimes that decoder is a software key that is on your computer or your player or whatever but without that drm without that decoder it, the file will not play so if you purchase and here's the fear if you purchase mqa audio files you may have to subscribe to an mqa player app or a streaming service to listen to the higher resolution even though you purchased the mqa file not only did you purchase the file, now you got to pay every month in order to use it to the fullest MQA height. And, you know, how is there an example of that? Yes, there is an example. That's Tidal. Now, you're paying for Tidal to get the regular streaming, which is $10, equal to, to Spotify. But then you're also paying an additional $10, which hikes it up total price to $20, so that you can use the MQA. See, do you see the problem now? Now, that's just Tidal. Tidal has its own freaky things. But if this becomes standardized, the argument is there is nothing that prevents music companies they, or streaming services like Apple, Tidal, which already does it, Spotify, you know, other applications, whoever you're streaming through, Amazon, to then demand that you pay a fee, whatever the fee happens to be whether it's a dollar to five dollars to ten dollars to whatever every month so that you can actually use the MQA standard it may this implementing this may block out other high resolution file formats if it becomes a standard for streaming meaning there might be better alternatives out there that never see the light of day because MQA takes over it could be an excuse for charging more you know like title and sound is subjective and the benefit of MQA may not really justify a price hike Several weeks ago, I did this A and B test between Spotify and Tidal. And I told you, I do hear a slight difference between Spotify and Tidal consistently. But the question remained, is that difference sufficient to justify the $10 hike in price? Would it justify me paying $10 more for Tidal per month? Maybe... If I'm that interested in having the highest quality streaming possible. But what holds me back significantly is the fact that Tidal is a terrible app. The search algorithm is awful. And that I don't think it really has a whole lot of music of, that Spotify has. Those are all the factors for my personal decision that I think Tidal is not worth it. But that, that's a separate issue. But even if you, you are interested in paying $20 a month, you have to say, is 
the sound difference significant enough? Is high-res Spotify at 11 bucks a month or 12 bucks a month, is that good enough for me? Or should I pay the extra money for MQA that may give me slight differences? Is MQA widely accepted? The answer is no, it is not widely accepted. You know, audiophile community is divided about this. Some swear that MQA sounds noticeably and considerably better than standard streaming. And, you know, there is some difference for sure. And others say there is no objective difference or it's inconsequential difference. So the truth is somewhere in between, very likely. That it's not amazing sound, but it's also not regular sound, normal streaming service. There is a benefit to MQA, but you have to decide whether it's worth it to you to upgrade, or, you know, quote unquote upgrade, to get that MQA sound. And currently, few streaming services are using it. I, it's, Tidal is the only one that I know of. Spotify hasn't implemented it yet, and I have no idea if they, if they will decide to implement it yet. Indeed, if you go to the Audiophiliacs YouTube channel, which will be linked to at the, at the end of this uh, slide here, uh, it, he talks about MQA, and he says it's not. It's not ubiquitous. It hasn't been fully adopted. And maybe it's because it's still young technology where PCM has been around for decades. But, you know, honestly, Tidal has been around long enough. And if it was going to take off, it would have probably taken off. And Spotify, at least, would have probably offered that as a feature. And they have it yet, as far as I know. So what is DSD? We talked about PCM. We talked about MQA. Now let's talk about DSD. DSD stands for Direct Stream digital not a great name it's not like master quality authentication it's direct stream digital it's like somebody just phoned this one in it's direct stream digital it comes in several flavors dsd 128 256 and 512 oh my goodness that sounds so amazing now here's the difference it's going to get a little complicated it is one bit with 2.8224 megahertz sampling rate or 64 times higher than standard 44.1 kilohertz of CD quality. Oi. Okay, so how do we understand this? Now, compared to PCM, which uses 16 or 24 bits typically, and DSD only uses one bit. Holy cow, only uses one bit? So that's 1 1 16th of the bits or 1 1 24th of the bits? How is this even good then? Well, because DSD makes up for the shortfall by sampling the bits significantly faster than PCM. Here's, here's how the numbers work out. DCD, DSD 128, 256, and 512. These numbers designate how many times higher the sampling rate is compared to CD quality. Okay, DSD standard is 64 times more. So 64 times more than the standard 44.1 kilohertz. So whatever 44.1 kilohertz is, multiply that by 64, and you come out to 2.8224 megahertz. That's the standard DC, DSD. But if you go to DSD 128, it's 128 times more than CD quality of 44.1. DSD 256 is 256 times more, and DSD 512, you guessed it, is 512 times more. And these are... You can find these numbers. You can verify that what I'm saying is accurate by going to these links here. Go check those out if you want. So what's the bottom line? Look, we, let's go back to the fundamentals for a minute. Humans hear typically between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. That is our listening range. A lot of us don't even re hear that, that much. A lot of us don't get down to 20 hertz. A lot of us don't go up to 20 kilohertz. As you progress in your age, the narrower your narrower narrower, the smaller your audible frequency range becomes. Out anything outside that range is inaudible, except for superhuman audiophiles who can also fly. Okay, only available to those individuals who are so special. Higher sampling rates can make an audible difference depending on the encoding method. This is what I said all the way back at the very beginning of this. PCM 44.1 kilohertz may sound different from PCM at 96 kilohertz. But only if, you know, there's sufficient bits there. If it's a 4-bit PCM file, sampling it at 96 kilohertz may not make any difference, right? But if it's a 16-bit at 96 kilohertz 
or a 24-bit at 96 kilohertz, that might make a big difference. But we only hear so many gradations and differences. Remember when, we, when I spoke of the pyramid example? And I said 65,000 steps to the top versus um, 16 million steps to the top. And then I said, you know, the, at some point, the difference between 16 million and 20 million is inconsequential. It doesn't make any difference. It all becomes the same. That's what I mean. The gradations and differences become inconsequential at some point for all of us. It might be different for all of us, but it does happen. For streaming services, NQA can make an audible difference. But is it worth double the cost? Is it worth the hassle of trying to find something that actually plays the uh, MQA, at, at least for streaming? PCM versus DSD is a battle that is yet to be decided. Now, this is because you know DSD theoretically is a simpler way of encoding than PCM, where PCM, you're talking about 16 or 24 bits at 44.1. So that's a lot of bits to, to crunch through, whereas DSD is just one bit, but you're sampling it a lot faster. For computer chips, there is a difference. For algorithms, there is a difference. For decoding, there is a difference. For you and me, I can't even make heads or tails of how this stuff works, but this is how apparently it works. So which technology to future-proof? Well, it's very expensive DAX and DAPs implement both DSD and MQA. Uh, digital audio players that are $500 or more will probably have both of these. PCM is uncompressed raw signal. If you want uncolored sound, PCM would be the preferable way to go for home audio, and that is standard. Okay, That's why it is the standard. So you don't have to worry about trying to find something that's PCM compatible. They usually are. Now, if you had to choose between DSD and MQA, if, you, if somebody said you have to choose now or something bad is going to happen to you, which one should you choose? Well, do you stream your music? If so, MQA. Do you download high-resolution files? If so, DSD. That's, how, that's the simplest way for me to explain it. Now, people may disagree about this. That's fine. Go ahead and disagree all you want. But upload your own video and explain all this stuff, okay? Now, remember, if your source is poorly recorded or compressed and your headphones are super cheap and you have a weak amplifier, you're just wasting money on these file formats. Everything in the chain has to complement everything else. Otherwise, you're kind of handicapping yourself. It's like running a race and you're saying, I am only going to run this race in a hacky sack where everybody else is actually running a race. You're hopping around. Hacky sack? Not a hacky sack. A hop, hop sack. You know, potato sack, hacky sack. That's a little ball game thing. Never mind what I said. You're putting your legs into a sack and tying them off and you're saying, I'm going to run this race. Now, that's not, that's, you're never going to win. So start to, be, to end. You have to make sure that you're using a good source, a good deck, good amplifier, and yes, a good pair of headphones. Trapping out and buying something that simply is bad a really bad DAC, for example, which is hard to find these days, but a really bad DAC or a terrible pair of headphones, you are not going to get the superlative sound that you were hoping for by spending the money on everything else. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And then finally, as I said, listen to Steve Gutenberg. Steve has a brief discussion about all of this, and here is the YouTube channel if you want. Go to this Google Doc. I'll link it in the comments below. Go to the last slide, slide 16, and then here's this YouTube channel link and just copy and paste it into YouTube. Okay, so that is that. That is DSD and MQA and PCM. Hopefully, this has answered some questions if somebody had them. Look, don't get misled by the marketing stuff. PCM is standard. MQA is just for streaming. DSD is good if you have a file that has been used, compressed, or, or coded in DSD, and you have a player or a DAC that is capable of decoding DSD, and you may not hear a difference even if you do. Maybe that's not a huge difference for you. So unless you have heard DSD versus standard recordings, you are really lost in the mire. You have no idea whether or not this is really what you want. 
But if you have a player that does provide MQA and DSD, then and it has all the features that you want, all the other features you want, then it doesn't make a difference. You know, there's no reason why you shouldn't buy that player if that's what you want. Hopefully, this has been helpful. I am still sad that my court mojo is not here and that the United States Postal Service has screwed me once again, that eBay is not helping, and this seller has turned out to be a real pain in the ass. And uh, I'm very upset. And, and frankly, here's, here's my position. If I don't get this thing, if I don't get a refund, if I don't get money from USPS, if they don't find it, whatever, then I am never, ever going to buy anything. That's not true. I'm going to buy stuff from eBay. And I can't say I'm never going to buy the Cord Mojo because that's stupid. It's not the Cord Mojo's fault. I'm just so upset. So irritating. <sighs> okay, send good vibes. How about that? How about all of you send good vibes and you say, USPS, do your damn job and have me get my stuff or the alternative, give me my money and uh, do it quickly. I hope everybody has a wonderful Thursday evening at 6.30 just about. Enjoy it. Tomorrow's Friday. It's easy day Friday, hopefully. And then Saturday's going to come along. And you know, at least where I am, Saturday's going to be 77 degrees. Oh, my God. It's going to be fantastic. 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius. Uh, it's going to be great. Fantastic. Relaxing. And I hope it's a relaxing weekend for you as well. Have a wonderful weekend. And thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and listening and commenting. I hope you all have a wonderful, peaceful evening. Thanks again.